the American Journal of Psychiatry. This is Dr. Susan Schultz with highlights for the month of August 2007. Please note that the full text of all articles may be viewed online at ajp.psychiatryonline.org, including all author affiliations and disclosures. This month will feature a study by David Folsom and colleagues that examined whether Spanish-speaking Latinos in the U.S. differ from English-speaking Latinos and Caucasians in the use of mental health services by persons with serious mental illness. We'll also present two articles from the STAR-D study. Sylvia Paddock and colleagues report on an association between treatment outcome and the GRIC4 gene and Diane Warden and colleagues identify predictors of attrition during the initial treatment with citalopram. The STAR-D articles will be followed by a report from Rita Suri and colleagues. They discuss the effects of antidepressant treatment and depression among pregnant women on gestational age at birth and risk of preterm birth. This will be followed by three articles on bipolar disorder. One is by James Potash and colleagues, who describe the development of the Bipolar Disorder Phenome Database, a resource for genetic studies. The second is by Melissa Broatman and colleagues, who compare the psychiatric diagnoses among parents of youth with severe mood dysregulation to the diagnoses in parents of youth with narrowly defined bipolar disorder. We'll also highlight an editorial by Gabriel Carlson that asks, who are the children with severe mood dysregulation? Finally, we'll turn to a clinical trial reported by Mark Fry and colleagues. The narcolepsy drug modafinil was tested as an adjunctive treatment for bipolar depression. An editorial on this article by R. H. Bellmaker will also be highlighted. Let's begin with the article by David Folsom and colleagues entitled, A Longitudinal Study of the Use of Mental Health Services by Persons with Serious Mental Illness. Do Spanish-speaking Latinos differ from English-speaking Latinos and Caucasians? Most prior investigations of mental health services for Latinos have indicated that those with a mental illness are less likely to receive services than Caucasians. On the other hand, acculturation has also been shown to affect the use of health services by Latinos. Language has consistently been the strongest measure of acculturation in Latinos, and so these authors compared both Spanish-speaking and English-speaking Latinos with Caucasians in the same mental health system. The study examined cases in the San Diego public mental health system from 2001 to 2004. More than 6,000 patients were included. The settings of the initial treatment for severe mental illness in the three patient groups were compared. Severe mental illness was defined as schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, or major depression. Treatment settings were divided into four categories. Inpatient treatment, outpatient treatment, emergency room treatment, and treatment in the jail setting. Several differences were found. The Spanish-speaking Latinos were less likely to enter care through jail or emergency services than were the English-speaking Latinos or Caucasians. They were more likely to begin treatment in outpatient settings. However, even though they had the highest proportion of patients receiving outpatient services, they had the fewest visits. Differences in diagnostic and social factors were also found. About two-thirds of the Spanish-speaking Latino patients were female versus fewer than half of the other groups. The Spanish speakers were also more likely to live independently or with family. Of the three diagnoses studied, depression was more common among the Spanish speakers than among the other groups, and schizophrenia and bipolar were less common. The Spanish speakers were also less likely to have substance use disorders. However, the differences in the patterns of mental health treatment remained after the authors statistically controlled for clinical and demographic differences. The English-speaking Latinos were more similar to the Caucasians. However, they were five years younger on average and less likely to be homeless. They also had higher rates of schizophrenia and major depression and a lower rate of bipolar disorder 
when compared to the Caucasians. They were less likely to receive initial treatment through emergency services and more likely to receive treatment in jails or the outpatient setting. These findings are discussed in an editorial by Dr. Pedro Ruiz. Please refer to the August issue for his comments. Now we'll turn to the STAR-D articles. STAR-D stands for Sequenced Treatment Alternatives to Relieve Depression. The study was designed to determine what options should be considered in sequential treatment for depressed outpatients who do not benefit adequately from an initial course of an antidepressant. First, we'll highlight the report by Sylvia Paddock and colleagues, the association of GRIC4 with outcome of antidepressant treatment in the STAR-D cohort. An initial genetic screen of a subgroup of the STAR-D cohort was reported earlier. It revealed an association between treatment response and a marker in the HTR2A gene, which encodes a serotonin receptor implicated in antidepressant mechanisms. In the present study, the authors examined results from all 1,800 genotyped patients in the STAR-D cohort, as well as more than 600 psychiatrically healthy comparison subjects. The study included more than 700 markers covering 68 candidate genes. Two-thirds of the cohort was designated as the initial discovery group. The authors looked for any association between a marker and treatment response that was significant at a level of 0.01. Each marker identified in the discovery group was then tested in the other one-third of the cohort, referred to as the replication group. If the direction of the association was consistent in the two groups and was significant at 0.05, the marker was considered to be reproducibly associated with treatment response. Two markers met this standard. One was the marker on the HTR2A gene that had been identified in the earlier study. The other marker was located on the GRIC4 gene. This gene codes for a kainic acid type glutamate receptor. It does not alter the protein sequence, but may have functional relevance in the regulation of gene expression. The effect size of this marker was modest, but patients who were homozygous carriers of the identified alleles, both the GRIC4 and the HTR2A genes, were 23% less likely to experience non response to treatment compared to patients who did not have any of the marker alleles. The comparisons with healthy subjects revealed several significant differences. For the HTR2A gene, the marker associated with treatment response differed between the STAR-D treatment responders and the comparison subjects. One additional marker differed between the comparison subjects and the responders, and another marker differed between the comparison subjects and the non-responders. For the GRIC4 gene, the STAR-D non-responders differed significantly from the comparison subjects in 12 markers that were not strongly associated with each other. The responders did not show any differences from the comparison subjects in this gene. The finding of a connection between treatment outcome and the GRIC4 gene adds to the evidence for a role of the glutamate system in depression. The modest effect size of the association probably precludes any immediate clinical relevance. However, it may provide clues to the actions of antidepressants affecting serotonin neurotransmission and may shed light on critical downstream signaling cascades. Patient attrition in the first STAR-D treatment study is reported by Diane Warden and colleagues in their article, Predictors of Attrition During Initial Citalopram Treatment for Depression, a STAR-D report. Few studies of clinical practice have addressed attrition specifically, even though the rate may reach 60% in depression treatment. The first level of STAR-D was a 12-week trial of citalopram, Attrition was defined as an exit from the study after the baseline visit, but before the 12-week visit. This analysis also examined the time of attrition. Leaving the study after just the baseline visit was considered immediate attrition. Leaving after at least one additional visit 
was classified as late attrition. About one-fourth of the participants dropped out before week 12. Of these, about a third left treatment after only the baseline visit. Factors associated with each type of attrition were found through bivariate logistic regression models. To identify factors that were independently associated with attrition, stepwise logistic regression analyses were used. The variables that were significant in both types of analyses were younger age, lower education level, and African American ethnicity. For patients who dropped out of the study immediately after the baseline visit, better perceived mental health functioning was slightly associated with attrition. A lower dropout rate was found for patients with more than one episode of depression, which suggests a greater motivation to stay in treatment. Several other factors did not meet the conservative criteria for significance, but did attain a p-value of 0.001 in the logistic regression and showed a difference between groups of at least 7 percentage points. These variables included public insurance, Hispanic ethnicity, and a high number of additional psychiatric diagnoses. Patients who had had depression longer were less likely to drop out. Next, we'll highlight the report by Rita Suri and colleagues, The Effects of Antenatal Depression and Antidepressant Treatment on Gestational Age at Birth and Risk of Preterm Birth. A number of previous studies have suggested that exposure to antidepressants decreases gestational age at birth. Other studies did not show this relationship, but were limited by small study groups, lack of control for mother's mood state, and other factors. This study was designed to prospectively follow healthy women through pregnancy, monitor depression and anxiety, and collect information about medication use, as well as isolate the effects of antidepressant use on gestational age at birth and risk of preterm birth. A total of 90 women were included in the analyses. They were divided into three categories on the basis of antidepressant use. 49 had a diagnosis of major depressive episode and took antidepressants for more than half of their pregnancy. 22 had major depression, but no more than 10 days of exposure to antidepressants, and 19 women were healthy comparison subjects. Gestational age at birth was significantly lower for the depressed women who took antidepressants during pregnancy than for either of the other groups, the depressed women who did not take antidepressants and the healthy comparison group. Whereas the gestational age for the healthy women was 39.7 weeks, it was 38.5 for those who took antidepressants. Preterm birth was defined as less than 37 completed weeks of gestation. The rates of preterm birth also differed significantly among the three groups. The rate was 14% for the women who took antidepressants, 0% for the depressed women who did not take antidepressants, and 5% for the comparison group. However, prenatal antidepressant use did not have an adverse effect on the infant's birth weight or on the APGAR scores. To determine the effect of drug dose, the total group of women with major depression was divided into those with no antidepressant exposure, those who took low to medium doses, and those who took high doses. The dose category was determined by the highest dose taken during pregnancy for any length of time. Higher doses were significantly related to a lower gestational age at birth. The rate of preterm births was 20% in the high-dose group, 9% in the group that received low to medium doses, and 0% in the group that had no exposure to antidepressants. However, this difference was not statistically significant. The two groups of women with major depression had comparable durations and levels of depression during pregnancy, regardless of medication status. None of the women in the study, however, had severe depression. Now we'll turn from depression to bipolar disorder. First, we'll highlight the article by James Potash and colleagues, the Bipolar Disorder Phenome Database, a resource for genetic studies. 
Research suggests that multiple genes are involved in bipolar disorder, and it is difficult to identify individual genes with modest effects. However, identification of these genes may be facilitated by studying subtypes of bipolar disorder which may be more genetically homogenous. Several studies focusing on a single clinical feature have been shown to increase the evidence of genetic linkage in bipolar subjects. To create a database of clinical variables as a resource for genetic studies, the authors cataloged the features of bipolar disorder in two large family studies. The CHIP study collected data at three sites, the University of Chicago, Johns Hopkins, and the National Institute of Mental Health Intramural Program. The other study was the NIMH Genetics Initiative Bipolar Disorder Collaborative Project. The subjects in these studies were interviewed with the Schedule for Affective Disorders and Schizophrenia, or with one of four versions of the Diagnostic Interview for Genetic Studies. Because the data were collected in five projects with different instruments over 20 years, it was a major task to assemble a uniform clinical database. Research clinicians compared the items in the two types of interviews in order to extract data that were consistent. The similarity between interviews was greatest for depression and mania, and the sections on psychosis, alcohol use, and substance use were quite dissimilar. To verify that the information entered into the database was correct, random subsets of 30 to 50 subjects were chosen for verification against the original data. Data managers investigated any discrepancies that emerged as well as subject duplicates and other problems. The resulting Bipolar Disorder Phenome Database contains 197 variables on more than 5,700 subjects. DNA is available for nearly 5,400 subjects. The authors verified the power of the sample to detect genetic linkage and association by testing selected variables from the database. The relationship of bipolar disorder to severe mood dysregulation in children is discussed by Melissa Brotman, Ellen Liebenluft, and colleagues. Their article is titled, Parental Diagnosis in Youth with Narrow Phenotype Bipolar Disorder or Severe Mood Dysregulation. Non-episodic irritability and hyperarousal are characteristics of severe mood dysregulation, and whether this is a form of bipolar disorder has been debated. Bipolar illness has a strong genetic component, and an onset during childhood is associated with a particularly strong family history. If severe mood dysregulation is a form of bipolar disorder, it would be expected to share this familiality. Thus, the diagnosis of the parents of 30 children diagnosed with severe mood dysregulation were compared with the parental diagnoses for 33 children with narrow phenotype bipolar disorder. One-third of the parents of children with strictly defined bipolar disorder also had bipolar disorder compared with only 3% of the parents of children with severe mood dysregulation. This difference in familiality suggests that a diagnosis of bipolar disorder may not be warranted for children with non-episodic hyperarousal. Comments on this finding are provided by Gabrielle Carlson in her editorial, Who are the children with severe mood dysregulation? She points to the huge increases in the rates of bipolar diagnoses over the last decade. These suggest that clinicians may be applying the DSM-4 criteria in ways that are inconsistent. A condition that used to be characterized by discrete episodes of mania, depression, and return to premorbid personality is now synonymous, at least in children, with rages. Rages are anger episodes called mood swings when described by parents and are explosive outbursts clearly out of proportion in both intensity and duration to the precipitant. This symptom is felt to capture the extreme irritability seen in mania. However, the irritability that often characterizes rages may occur in conjunction with many childhood disorders, most notably attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, oppositional defiant disorder, anxiety disorders, depressive disorders, and autism spectrum disorders. 
One of the ongoing research questions identified by Liebenlof's laboratory in the NIMH intramural program is whether there is any legitimacy to the assumption that these rages characterize a specific type of bipolar disorder in youth. By specifically defining this rage disorder with criteria and calling it severe mood dysregulation, these researchers have made the nosologic status of rages a testable research question. The phenomenology, neurobiology, family history, and outcome of this condition can be compared with those of more historically defined bipolar disorder. In the report by Brotman and colleagues, the diagnostic interview for genetic studies was used to compare rates of parent psychiatric disorders for child probands with narrow phenotype bipolar 1 or 2 and for children with severe mood dysregulation. The authors confirmed the familiarity of early onset bipolar disorder in those with narrowly defined bipolar disorder and found only general population rates of bipolar disorder in the parents of children with severe mood dysregulation. We can say a bit more then about who these explosive children are not. They are not children at a high genetic risk for narrow phenotype bipolar disorder. Other reports from this laboratory suggest that ADHD and depression are more likely to prevail among youth in their late teens and young adults than is bipolar disorder. If the point of making a diagnosis of bipolar disorder in youth is to have it to map onto adult data for narrow phenotype bipolar disorder, a condition with a different family genetic profile and a different trajectory may have a different etiology and possibly require different treatment. This is clearly an important distinction then. But who are the children with severe mood dysregulation? These explosive children are not new. A closer look at the traditional diagnoses that apply to this group of youth gives us a further insight. There was no significant difference in the rates of ADHD between the children with narrowly defined bipolar disorder and those with severe mood dysregulation. However, more than twice as many children with severe mood dysregulation had oppositional deviant disorder. Their rate was 83% compared to 39% in children with bipolar disorder. In a personal communication, Brotman and colleagues shared very salient data about the children with severe mood dysregulation. The combination of ADHD and oppositional defiant disorder occurred in 27% of the children with narrow phenotype bipolar disorder, but 81% of those with severe mood dysregulation, virtually three times as many. Why is this important? It emphasizes that the confusion between uncomplicated or mild ADHD and mania is probably a red herring. No clinician confuses uncomplicated ADHD with mania. It is the combination of the disinhibition of ADHD and the irritability of oppositional defiant disorder that is confusing. At a minimum, it is the combination of ADHD and oppositional defiant disorder that should be compared with mania. If we recast children with severe mood dysregulation as children with prominent combined ADHD and oppositional defiant disorder, we find we have considerable knowledge about them already. A second point to be made regards the family history findings and the diagnostic interview for genetic studies. Although this instrument is quite comprehensive in its coverage of adult psychopathology, it severely shortchanges child psychopathology by not asking about many childhood disorders. For instance, the parents of children with severe mood dysregulation in the Brotman study had much lower rates of psychopathology than the parents of children with narrow phenotype bipolar disorder. That is a rather staggering finding. Most studies of children with ADHD and oppositional defiant disorder find high rates of psychopathology in family members. If children with severe mood dysregulation are basically mood dysregulated children with ADHD plus oppositional defiant disorder, we would certainly expect to find ADHD, oppositional defiant disorder, conduct disorder, and antisocial personality disorder in these families. Unless, of course, no one asked about these conditions. On the other hand, 
if rates of psychiatric disorder are truly that much lower in the parents of children with severe mood dysregulation, perhaps many of these youngsters will have transient, stress-related developmental problems that will not impair them in the future. This concludes the highlights of the editorial by Gabriel Carlson. Please refer to the August issue for the full editorial and the Broatman article. Finally, we'll turn to the article by Mark Fry and colleagues, a placebo-controlled evaluation of adjunctive modafinil in the treatment of bipolar depression. Modafinil is approved for treating excessive sleepiness associated with narcolepsy. The study was conducted to evaluate the efficacy and safety of adjunctive modafinil in bipolar depression, which is often characterized by excessive sleepiness and fatigue. The participants were 85 patients with bipolar depression that was inadequately responsive to a mood stabilizer with or without an antidepressant. They were randomly assigned to either modafinil or placebo in addition to their current regimen. The adjunctive treatment lasted for six weeks. Remission of the bipolar depression occurred in 39% of the patients taking modafinil, but only 18% of those taking placebo. In addition, the modafinil group had greater reductions in depression scores at weeks 2, 4, 5, and 6. The use of antidepressants did not contribute to the between-group differences. The Fry article is the subject of an editorial by Robert Bellmaker, Modafinil Add-on in the Treatment of Bipolar Depression. He provides some background on modafinil. After it was approved for narcolepsy, it was found to be safe and effective for attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. However, its biochemical mechanism is different from that of amphetamine and other common pharmacological treatments for ADHD, which release dopamine. While there are no studies showing that modafinil is superior to amphetamine or methylphenidate in ADHD or narcolepsy, it seems to have a low abuse potential. Additional uses for modafinil based on its stimulant properties have been explored in several additional diagnoses. Previous studies have not found that modafinil is effective in unipolar depression. It is tempting to think its efficacy for bipolar depression may reflect a higher prevalence of psychomotor retardation, which would be more responsive to modafinil. However, measures of fatigue and sleepiness did not differ between modafinil and placebo in the study by Fry and Associates. Manic switch was also not more common with modafinil than with placebo. However, the mean daily dose of modafinil was only 174 milligrams, and studies in narcolepsy and ADHD have sometimes used much higher doses. Also, patients with past histories of stimulant-induced mania were excluded from the Fry study. The present study was double-blind, but all participants, both doctors and patients, knew that it was a study of a new medicine with stimulant-like properties. It is likely that the appropriate patients referred to this study were felt by themselves and their physicians to need a stimulant-like compound, perhaps because of fatigue, listlessness, or psychomotor retardation. Patients with prominent agitation or insomnia would be less likely to be referred to or consent to participate in a study where they might receive a stimulant. This could be partially responsible for the positive results. Does the present study mean that modafinil is the treatment of choice for all bipolar patients with depression? We should avoid assuming that a statistical benefit of one treatment for bipolar depression as a diagnostic entity is relevant for every patient with this heterogeneous condition. The patients in the present study were all taking mood stabilizers. Starting a mood stabilizer would be the first choice for any patient not being so treated. Many of the patients in the Fry study were taking one mood stabilizer, and other studies have shown that adding a second mood stabilizer can often be effective. Given that modafinil is expensive, there may well be bipolar depressed patients for whom appropriate treatment would be a reuptake inhibitor that is also effective on noradrenaline, such as venlafaxine.
there have been some preclinical studies of potential wakefulness-inducing treatments that work biochemically by inhibiting the histamine H3 receptor in the brain. However, modafinil even has behavioral effects in mice whose H3 receptor is genetically knocked out. It is possible that modafinil is working on the hypocretin system, a unique peptide neurotransmitter system that is abnormal in narcolepsy but is unlikely to be a key player in the biochemical mechanism of bipolar depression. Therefore, one could think of modafinil as a nonspecific or symptomatic treatment of bipolar depression. Treatments recently found to be useful in depression are quite diverse, ranging from exercise interventions to ketamine, an anesthetic that antagonizes NMDA receptors. It may be that a symptomatic rather than a hypothesis-bound mode of thinking is the best way for a clinician to help a patient with bipolar depression. This concludes the audio highlights of the August issue of the American Journal of Psychiatry. We invite you to refer to the online issue at ajp.psychiatryonline.org for the full text of these and other articles. Thank you.